I'll be seesawing between the past, the present, and I was happy to hear other talks about past, present, futures, because that's kind of my world, the subconscious, the conscious, as well as the land. Mm -hmm. That talk that you gave this morning deeply, deeply moved me about the land. And I'll share um, my experiences with the land um, through these lines. And I would like to thank for helping me clicking the next slide. <laughs> this is another everyday moment that happened to me. It was maybe about 2006. I was traveling on the 10 freeway, and on the freeway, I saw this Buddha statue right on the bed of a pickup truck, and I said, oh my gosh, is there a, a Thai restaurant or a Thai temple I don't know about that's around this area? I was on my way to work to Crate and Barrel, um, on the 10th freeway, I don't, for those of you who are in Los Angeles, it's a major pain in the butt of a freeway because it's clogged up the ass. So I had time to study the truck, and the truck happily exited La Siena Boulevard, which is great because that's my way to Crate and Barrow in Beverly Hills. So I drove up, 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 you know, just kind of like slightly behind. The truck came to stop at the center of Olympic Boulevard and La Cienega. And I drove up right next to it, just wanting to see a little closer because I couldn't make out. And what I saw was a strap around the neck, and I was shocked. And that everyday moment just triggered memories and floods of memories from my childhood. The very first memory I had was when I was in fifth grade, and um, I had this teacher, his name is, is Mr is or maybe was, I'm not sure, Warren Proud, Mr. Proud. Mr. Proud had us memorize a lot of things. He had us memorize the, Star, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. He had us memorize the Bill of Rights. He had us memorize a whole lot of things. He had us memorize the Star Spangled Banner. Now, as a child who just immigrated to the United States, not so many years, uh, maybe about two, three years, I understood, oh yes, Declaration, I mean, the Star Spangled Banner, that's the national anthem, I must learn this song, you know, it's, it, I'm here. Um, but it's, it's, it's Sir Francis Scott Key, and there's four stanza to, to, to the Star Spangled Banner. But as a kid, I thought, well, why do I have to memorize four stanza? I only need to know the first stanza to be able to sing the song. So I raised my hand, Mr. Proud, let's do that. Mr. Proud, why do I have to memorize the Star Spangled Banner? And he looked at me and he said, if you're not happy, you can go back to your own country. And I didn't know what to do except just sit down and I couldn't speak a word until after class I went into the principal's office. Mrs. Reddy, Mr. Proud says something bad. What? I said, he told me to go back to my home country. And Mrs. Reddy said, please invite your mother to the office the next day. I went back home, used every word, every adjective imaginable in Thai to describe Mr. Proud because I was pissed off. <laughs> um, the next day, uh, we all sat in the office. I looked him in the eyes and said, Mr. Proud, you told me to go back to my home country. Mrs. Redding looked at Mr. Proud and she said, apologize to the child. That's was the, one of the flood of memories um, that weave itself through from the past to the very present, 2006 on Olympic Boulevard and La Siena um, Boulevard. These are what I called um, poetic resistance. And it, it also sparked an, another childhood memory. It was a very first visual memory um, of, of, of Rosa Parks. And I didn't speak English a whole lot at the time, but I understood the story of what happened because of the, just the simple actions and simple gestures. And that's what I, I undertake in my performative works, is undertaking these simple actions and simple gestures that may, may seem mundane, but collectively over time, it becomes powerful. So I left the United States. I left um, my fourth year university. I decided to go um, uh, study overseas to Hong Kong. And um, long story short, I ended up staying in Hong Kong. I worked there and uh, I even taught English.
English in, in southern China, my father came to visit me and it, we decided to take a road trip up to Shantou. Um, that's an area where I, I taught English up there and also it was an area where my, my um, fraternal dialect, that's what my father speak, that dialect. And that was one of the main reasons why I chose to go there, you know, to Shantou, just to be connected. And, you know, we were at the hotel and I asked my father, Papa, do we have relatives here? He said, I don't know, I was born in Thailand just like you. So he called his aunt um, in Bangkok and she said, you have relatives here in Shanto. Long story short, she came to our hotel and took us to my ancestral house, my great grandfather's house, which was about a two hour drive up away. That event shifted my work. You know, I, I studied economics at UCSD. I didn't know anything about art. Thanks. So I ended up, you know, I, 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 I ended up documenting my great grandfather's house for two years, spending two years. I didn't know how to draw a map. I tried to bribe local officials. This is the days before Google map. Uh, with cigarettes to see if there was any drawn maps, none, but uh, I hop on a bicycle with a compass, end up drawing the entire house, um, measuring every uh, inch of the house, conduct oral interview, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward to another moment. So, my, my, um, what I do is I, I run um, the China Outpost. And this is a good introduction to the China Outpost, because I'll give you my elevator speech about the China Outpost. It's what I define as my self-imposed sweatshop. And this is where the Crate and Barrel you know, biography comes back in. Uh, it's a place where I, I, um, I fabricate discarded materials, mostly discarded plastic bags, and I, I, I process them, cut them into threads, and weave them back into a single thread to eventually use uh, that material to reconstruct my great-grandfather's house. And this is another um, everyday moment for me. Um, it was a very important moment that shifted the work of the China Outpost. It's where I've, I've discovered the material of the plastic bags. And this was a collaboration with, with another colleague of mine, Christina Pearson, while in grad school. We, it was a notion of play initially that, that was started the project was we were discussing with plastic bags. And then there were these plastic bag islands the size of Texas or two floating in the Pacific Ocean. That was pretty much the premise. But what started it all, what a successful collaboration happens is that when you carry on the materials with you and you process them on your own. And that's what I did. We went to Ontario Mill Small, decided to make uh, cuttings, inspired by Gordon Mountain Clark's cuttings, from one entry point to another, um, collected the plastic bags um, from our classmate for the, over the course of three to four weeks, tied them all into one thread, and just walked and walked and walked. Um, this was significant in the sense that it introduced the material for me, a suffocating material for me. It's a material that disgusts me, but it also taught me something. It's, it's taught me to question how can I turn something that abs I absolutely disgust and hate to turn into something that's beautiful. How do I do that? And that translates to my other works. So another moment, I'm kind of going back and forth, back and forth. So I've, I've, I've thought about the, the plastic bag, the plastic threads. Christine and I, we tied the bags together. I, I, I thought, oh, how can I do this, process this? I can process into threads, that's great. And I can, what about crocheting it? Why if I crochet this into uh, wall materials of the house? That would be great, it's, it's, it's an American craft, I can do this. So while this was in the back burner, um, I often sit, I, I travel to spaces where I just sit Ten Union Station at uh, Los Angeles train terminus. It's, it's a special place for me to sit because um, there are layers and layers and layers of history that lies underneath. Um, and what's ironic, it used to be the, form, the original site of the Chinatown in Los Angeles. And uh, it, 
people were displaced, families were displaced to make room for the last major train terminus um, on the West Coast. So I sat and there was these film crew um, in this main lobby and I, I have often passed by this lobby thinking, wouldn't it be great to reconstruct my great grandfather's house here, the last term train terminus? So I've asked one of the managers who were there and, and they said, I said, how much would it cost to you know, rent a space here? Um, I'm an artist, I'd like to reconstruct my great grandfather's house here. And, um, you know, and he, he, he said, how much do you have? Because they, they rent these for film crews and weddings and things. I said, I don't know, I can apply for a grant, maybe 10,000, this is how naive I was. And this was his response. <laughs> Your budget will not even cover the cost of our toilet budget for the month. <laughs> oh, that was a big gut wrencher. I said, oh crap, what am I gonna do? So I said, well, you know what? I'm gonna go to Chinatown. I'm gonna go to the new Chinatown. I'm gonna look for space and I'm gonna start to fabricate these materials from Chinatown. So there, and that's what I did. Oh, wait, another special moment before we travel to Chinatown back to Crate and Barrel on that very same year. You know, I have to clock in, I have to clock out, clock in, clock out. I place myself within the confines of the clocking in and the clocking out, and one day my manager told me, um, we're getting away, we're getting rid of these manual time clocks, we're gonna go digital. If you have a special, you know, connection, relationship with this object, you know, now it's time to say bye-bye. I said, fuck yeah, I do, so. <laughs> I travel and I walked, I walked, I walked to this, this bastard of a time clock and I looked at it and I said, okay, I'm gonna own you. And I'm gonna buy you. And that's what I did. I marched into my, my, my manager's room and I said, I like to own it and I like to buy it. Well, six, seven months, I think it was six, seven months, even longer maybe, through the corporate loophole, through the corporate crap and all. Ended up, I couldn't purchase it. My manager at the end of the day, purchased it for me to set up shop in Chinatown. So I, I used the time clock and I moved it to, I found a site in um, Chinatown to set up shop there. That is my first significant, um, that was my first site of the China Outpost. It located underneath the defunct art gallery on Chongqing Road. And I took the time clock there and I placed it there and that's where I clock in and I clock out under my own terms. And I thought, how am I going to share this with other people? So, of course, you know, we rely on social media, the hype of, you know, Ustream, I think, um, Twitter. Um, yeah, those were the two that I, I used at the time. But it was very isolating. I never got a chance to do this. This is what I enjoy most, is, is, is this, is, is sharing the story with, with everybody. Um, but I did that for a number of years, accumulating the materials. You know, that you may question the form of, of this. I created the giant spool on a lazy Susan. It's a sculpture only for practical reason initially because I initially start to build balls of these plastic yarn, but it injured my wrist. So I said, okay, I'll devise something to change it. And that's what I did. And it was broadcast, my tears continue to accumulate until I was invited to um, take on, tackle this space. This is at the Armory Center for the Arts. The one unique um, thing that, 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 that touched me, I have five minutes, better speed up, okay, was these multiple entry points. And these multiple entry points uh, triggered a dream that I had. And in the dream, I dreamt that my body was in the boat, um, washed ashore by the riverbank, and I left the boat, but my body was still in the boat. And there were these steps that led up these hillside. And I started to walk halfway up, realized, only to realize that, well, if my body is here, who's down there, you know? So I said, no, 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 I have to retrace back to the riverside, to the riverbank. And uh, I said, how am I gonna carry this boat up? I asked curious passerby to help me. And eventually people did, I carried my body up. Um, along with others to what I can recall being an open field. So these multiple entry points trigger that memory, so I ended up creating um, uh, a house for a boat that I handcrafted. But the, 
But the important thing is, is this part here that I, I wanted to show the slides. Is that I did crochet a many two, a four by eight drywall size of plastic bag, but when I got to the site, I said, there is no way I'm gonna crochet to be able to fill this entire space. So, another part of my practice is about letting go. So I let go, I just unravel everything, all my work, and, I, and there's something that my teacher have taught me, if you let go of something precious, something great, it will come, and it led to, to this. So now I have a premise to build the wall material for the house. And I decided to take the boat and reenact the walk. I said, why not reenact this walk? I chose the lowest point of continental United States, and I took this boat that I constructed and walked to the trailhead of the highest point of continental United States. Um, part two is to, and I cremated the bamboo skeleton form of that boat, um, fired an urn to house the ashes. So part two um, is to walk to the top of Mount Whitney and spread the ashes in there. I walked. Thanks. <laughs> this is another significant site which I, I was, I returned to the, the China outpost morph and, 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 and changed to function more and more uh, within a nomadic framework. And this was my very first site where I took resident at the armory where I engaged with, with um, um, visitors on a weekly basis. And thus I include this slide. Thanks. And I continue to work. So we've moved from social media to something live. Yes. Next. And this high desert test site is a uh, an art space in the desert, and my biggest question when I initially traveled to the space and to the site is, okay, <laughs> what defines what defines this space as an art space, and what defines this space as a as what? You know, isn't that all the same? So I spent uh, a day with the curator, defined the outer borders of high desert test high desert test site, and excavated excavated the soil and the land from what is so-called within the borders of high, de high desert test site and carried the material over to the other side. And this was the very first time that I reconstructed my great-grandfather's house. It's a floor plan, it's a foundation, it's significant, and I used the land from the other side to construct it. And I gave a home tour as people come. Um, this, is the, this is where the altar is located. And in 2014, I finally made my way back to Union Station, all mobile. And I continue to work. I was kicked out in the lobby space, but we'll pass that, next. I worked, next. And where is this headed to is increasing that mobility. The China Outpost will relocate it on the back bed of my pickup truck, and it will operate within the um, big lots of big box stores, um, parking lots of big box stores throughout Surreal's Road. And this is a major thoroughfare um, leading to Santa Fe. Um, and it has lost its intimacy over the years to these big stores. So the outposts will function in a way to continue to fabricate the material, but at the same time engage in conversations with curious passerbys um, for open-ended conversation about migration and the labor of adapting to a new home. Thank you. Why Santa Fe? Santa Fe is a very magical place. It's a, it's a place that um, that draws you there. If if that drew me there, it's, um, through serendipitous conversations that I've had, um, which I can share. I don't know how much time, but this is a long story. I'll share with you on um, on the side. But it's basically through a series of serendipitous moments and conversation that had led me to Santa Fe and it continued to draw me back. And um, 
Santa Fe for a short answer is I was accepted to um, the Santa Fe Arts Institute for two months residency there. So that coincided with all these serendipi serendipitous moments that have happened. Any other questions? Brief questions? 